Good evening, friends. First of all, let me congratulate Pasang Lamu for that fantastic story she told us. What an adventurous life, what a dangerous life that she lived. I have not climbed any mountains. I have lived all around the world trying to solve problems, mountains of problems of the world, and most problems still remain. So when I talk of an unexplored world or an uncharted realm, I'm going to say that today the world itself is an uncharted realm. Five days ago, the world changed. I don't know whether you realized it. Thanks to a gentleman called Donald Trump. <laughs> the world was dangerous even before. It was volatile already. But there was a certain comfort zone for all of us. We knew that the United States and Russia would be fighting with each other. We knew that India and Pakistan can never be friendly. We knew that there is climate change which is going to destroy all of us. We knew all these things and we tried to fight all of them. But today, the world is very different. We have to get ready for a new world. Good or bad, we don't know, but it'll be a new world. This is not the first time that we have these dramatic changes in the world. When the Second World War ended, there was a big change. When the internet came into being, there was a big dramatic change in the world. When the Berlin Wall collapsed, there was a dramatic change. And now we have a dramatic change with a leader who is most unpredictable. Can diplomacy cope with Donald Trump? That is the topic today. How do we deal with this uncharted realm of world diplomacy? Can it succeed? Can we cope with the changes? Can one man change the world? Can human civilization deal with certain idiosyncrasies of the leaders of the world, is the question. And the answer is, no one man, no one movement can ruin the civilization of the world, and that is our best hope. So the story I'm going to tell you is the story of diplomacy over the ages. <laughs> Many people have tried to define diplomacy. The most famous story, famous explanation or description of diplomacy is, a diplomat is an honest gentleman who lies abroad for his country. <laughs> or he is someone who asks you to go to hell in such a way that you look, look forward to the trip. Or a gentleman who's, who walks on thin ice and does not fall into the hot water. And you know, of course, the difference between a lady and a diplomat. If a lady says no, she means maybe. When a lady says maybe, she means yes. But if she says yes, she is no lady. The diplomat is the opposite. If a diplomat says yes, he means maybe. When he says maybe, he means no. If he says no, he's no diplomat. And also there is a definition that diplomacy is doing the nicest things, nastiest things with the nicest face. You have to have two faces for every diplomat to show it one to the world and the other to the Indian mythology is full of diplomats. And the greatest and the oldest diplomat in Ramayana is the Hanuman. And I would say Hanuman is an ideal diplomat because he goes on a message of peace and friendship, gets hurt, and then he turns into a weapon himself and burns the country which irritated him or insulted him. So that is the, so in the ancient days, the diplomat survived not because of any other skill, but because of the skill of physical strength and it was shown that you need superhuman qualities. And that is what Hanuman was all about. 
But think about Krishna, the great diplomat that he was. He tried to negotiate with the Kauravas a good deal for the Pandavas. And finally, when the arguments failed, the Kauravas wanted to arrest him and the Kurukshetra war followed. So diplomats of ancient times had to resort not only to arguments and negotiations, but also to physical strength. And today's diplomats do not have that physical strength. And what, did, what happened in the old days when one country did not like another? So you sent a gunboat. That was the oldest kind of diplomacy. You send a gunboat and immediately the other side will surrender. But today it has changed. And now they say that when the natives are revolting, he says, send a million dollars to them. That is, that is called silver bullet diplomacy. So from gunboat diplomacy, we have moved to silver bullet diplomacy. And that story is what we are going to tell today. There was some way of dealing with various things. And the wife tells him that you should have tried diplomacy first, because seeing him after his adventures abroad, she says maybe diplomacy was better than, than war. So the ancient times, when uh, the first time the sovereign states were established, there came a new tribe of people called plenipotentiaries. So those days, an ambassador called a plenipotentiary, even now we are called that, but we don't have any of those powers that the plenipotentiary had. So they sailed into the sunset, to the unexplored world. And then they went there, and they had the power to negotiate war and peace. And sometimes even married princes in order to create peace in that country. And of course, there are all, the, all kinds of dangers. Some of them never came back. In fact, one of my predecessors told me that he went to a country. When he visited the head of state, the head of state said, you are very welcome. And then he added that your predecessor was delicious because it was a cannibal country. So this was the kind of danger. But those were the golden age of diplomacy because they had the power to do anything. Their country, the president or the prime minister would not even know what they were doing. And he, he could write a letter once in a month by the diplomatic bag. Otherwise, they were enjoying themselves and enjoyed what was called the authority of the state. But that changed very soon. When there was greater interchange, the transportation became easier. And there was even very modern technology like telex and teleprinter. And then diplomacy changed again. Because you couldn't send any news home because the news was already at home. And your job was not to send news, not to fight with international agencies, but to give analysis. And that is the first change that happened in diplomacy as a result of the telecommunications revolution. But that was a very primary revolution at that time. And then came the CNN. The CNN in the 80s transformed diplomacy beyond recognition. Because still the CNN came, what I told my government was the law. What I told them was happening in my country was important to the government. But then CNN started streaming live stories into the foreign offices. So we in the embassies had a tough time coping with CNN. But CNN did a fantastic thing. This is what the CNN did. Because what they wanted to, we realized that they were fast and communicating very fast with the rest of the world. But then we realized that they were doctoring their pictures. They were trying to present what they thought was the world should know. And then the role of the diplomat changed again. The role of the diplomat became not simply describing, not simply telling the people what it is, but also telling them what the truth is. So CNN made diplomacy important to distinguish between what they wanted to tell the world and what the world really was. And that was another change in the diplomatic attitude. But then came the revolution in, in diplomacy which was the internet. The internet completely transformed diplomacy because everything was available everywhere. And there was no need. At one time, we all thought that diplomacy had become redundant. There was need, no need for us in this world. But then 
came the realization that internet can not, can not only be helpful and useful, many of you might consider internet dangerous because your children should not be, see those scenes, but it became dangerous for diplomacy with the advent of two gentlemen, Julian Assange and Snowden. They did, what he did was, Julian Assange started hacking diplomatic mails since 2006. And he, in fact, released 10 million documents between 2006 and 2015. So confidentiality, which was considered the most important ingredient of diplomacy, disappeared from the face of the earth. Always we are trying to tell people what we wanted them to hear, without realizing if you knew that all you set your counterparts abroad would come out into the open, people were scared about it. And that is really what happened. Julian Assange and Snowden, in fact, began exposing diplomacy, exposing particularly the US State Department. And of course, we, some of us, came out well in that because all our telegrams also leaked, but there was no single Indian diplomat who had some, said something different in private what he would not say in public. But many countries of the world were embarrassed by it. Many countries of the world actually thought that, in fact, Assange and Snowden were the kind of people who will take care of the world because uh, Snowden, in fact, showed to the world that it was the United States intelligence itself was, you know, was uh, nosing around with other people's lives. And then the source became changed. You can see people say, believing not what we say or what appears in the press, but they will ask Snowden's advice as to whether Obama will come to the Soviet Union or to, the, to Russia. So that kind of situation has developed as a result of this low, loss of confidentiality in uh, diplomacy. So when someone says that I hear that the diplomats of the United States are very upset with us, or the Europeans are very upset with us, they say, yes, that is what we hear from the monitored telexes of these governments. So it all shifted. Diplomacy shifted from uh, a human activity, from a human activity to an activity which is very secret and very secretly taken out to embarrass the people. Of course, secrecy was very important in diplomacy. Even today, it is, because it is essential for us to wait and say things or find things when only it is ready for, for uh, exposure. And that is what has changed as a result of the internet and the, uh, and the new uh, developments. And of course, you all know what happened in 2016 elections in the United States. It was a, it was a tussle between emails and females. <laughs> On the one side, somebody was accusing the others of females, and the other accused back and saying emails. So Hillary Clinton said, the email era is over. And then, now the, now the inter internet decides what the people should behave like because the hashtag is a very important one. So whenever there's a hashtag which affects you, you have to check out as to what is happening to the world. So that you are afraid, you are scared about what happens. You realize that this is the kind of information that you have, and you get to know even yourself more from the internet hashtags than from anything else. And now, with the Facebook and Twitter. Now diplomacy is on Facebook and Twitter. Now someone says, Iran is declaring ourselves a friend on the internet. What do we do? So that is Facebook diplomacy. And today, all the prime ministers and presidents have gone to Twitter so that in 140 characters, they are able to convey to the world what exactly they want to do. So therefore, the diplomatic traditions have changed over the years. But what I, the message I want to convey is that in the different circumstances that the world has faced, diplomacy has survived all that and has also changed itself, adapted itself to remain relevant. Because the world without diplomacy will be a poor world in spite of all the changes that have taken place. But the gift, the real gift 
of the internet to the world, to the diplomatic world, is what is called public diplomacy. Because today, diplomacy is not confined to the governments, not confined to diplomats. It is now the property of the whole world. Public diplomacy is important because you need to keep your people informed. In the old days, people were not bothered as to what you did with foreign policy. But today, it is open. There is public diplomacy. So every country in the world justifies themselves to the, their audiences, their home audiences. It's not only that you convey things to the other governments and try to resolve issues, try to get the best of them with giving them the least. And that kind of exercise has changed. And now the people have to go to the public and tell them as to what the government proposes to do in a particular situation. So from a situation where diplomacy was secret, it was powerful, it was a plenipotentiary affair, then the, the revolution, the, the communications revolution like any other profession, diplomacy has also changed. And then we were able to stem through all these crises through the various technologies, the various methodologies that we had in the last many years of diplomatic life. And now everything has changed with Mr. <laughs> with, <laughs> with Mr. Trump. So what is it that he is trying to do? What is it the world is going to be? Because what he is trying to do is to really remove all the kinds of beliefs and the faith that we had. Cold War was a reality. Cold War was over before Putin came back to power, but he had in fact started the Cold War again. So uh, two countries who were Cold Warriors all these years are saying that they will be friends again. Is that possible? Is it possible for the United States and Russia to be friends and cordial? Are they going to trust each other? If that happens, the whole story of the world will change. China will change, India will change, Japan will change, because all these are fixed in various positions, various areas of human activity. And if it changes, what happens? We believe that climate change is a very serious problem. We believe that 200 years from now, many parts of the world will disappear. But Mr. Trump says climate change is a hoax made by the Chinese. How comfortable it is. There's not going to be any climate change. You don't need to control your greenhouse gas emissions. He says, for example, that the United Nations is not reliable. Why the United Nations? He says it's a club where everybody comes to come and talk and not do anything. So I don't, want, I don't care about the United, States, the United Nations. So this is a major issue that faces us, the world of the future, because it is the United States. He was president of Colombia. It would not have made any difference to us. But of course, the comfort that we have is Mr. Trump has been very friendly with India. He had a very good conversation with Mr. Modi last night. And they are of the same feather. <laughs> Don't you see that Modi is very much like, he says, this is nativism. My country is great. And both of them say the same thing. Both of them say, we are great. So there is going to be some kind of a friendship between India and the United States. We are already friendly. Maybe we'll become friendlier. But the message is, that diplomacy has a role to play, whatever happens in this world. And we have reached a stage in our civilization that no single person or a single movement can destroy the world. On that happy note, thank you.